and they could do 57 ounce copper. <laughs> That's like, I forget what it comes out to, but it's something like a quarter inch thick copper. <laughs> That's almost a joke. Like, it's ridiculous. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Altium On Track podcast. I am your host, Zach Peterson. I'm very happy to be here today with Mario Strano, uh, senior PCB designer at Nicola and also president of ECAD Central. We're going to be talking to him today about his journey and eventually making it to uh, work at Nicola and also what he does through his business, ECAD Central. Uh, Mario, thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, th thanks, Zach. Thanks for having me on. You know, uh, you've, you've never been on the podcast before, but um, I know you actually uh, do some work servicing all team customers through ECAD Central. Um, maybe before we talk about that and uh, what folks uh, need from ECAD Central, maybe we can uh, learn a little bit more about you and your background and um, how you got to, to where you are uh, at Nicola. Yeah, sure. So um, I started p doing PCB design 14 years ago. I was working for a startup company called Sequel and Semiconductor. Uh, it was acquired by Texas Instruments, and then a position opened up to learn PCB design uh, from the ground up. Uh, my manager at the time taught me uh, best practices for PCB design for power electronics. It was a power supply business unit that I worked at for Texas Instruments. Um, learned pads and uh, did design work in, in Menta Graphics pads for about two years. Did a few designs in uh, Orcad Allegro as well, uh, but for the last 12 years, I've been using uh, Altium Designer exclusively. Um, so basically, I worked at several companies as a PCB designer since my time at TI. Uh, I worked as a component engineer slash PCB designer as well at uh, Avnet for six years. I'm currently the only PCB designer at Nikola Motor Corporation right now. Um, we're going to hire on at least one other person, though. We're starting to get to the point where uh, time schedules are going to are going to be impacted negatively if we don't get another resource. And that's uh, that's pretty much that's pretty much that. I did a lot of EC or evaluation modules when I was at Texas Instruments for these power supply and power phases and whatnot. So I got really good at doing power electronics, but uh, when it comes PCB designs, but when it comes to the work that I'm doing at, at Nikola, we're doing uh, you know 10 ounce copper boards, real heavy power boards, as well as um, I'm also doing HMI boards, human machine interface boards, such as like the uh, the board that controls the user uh, gauges heads up uh, or the user's gauges, and then also the um, infotainment, you know, there's the GPS maps um, and uh, audio and maybe in video, the camera interface, everything goes through the new machine interface uh, board that I did. Um, and also we do do a lot of, uh, do all the ECUs, electronic control units. They're, um, they're basically um, boards or designs that control aspects of the vehicle that one of them is a vehicle control module and one of the main functions of that is to translate the user's uh, accelerator pedal into you know signals that drive the the whole vehicle uh, propulsion and uh, I guess that's that's about it unless you have any other questions on that so you said you started in a semiconductor company before it got bought out by by Texas Instruments was that correct yeah, so Cyclone Semiconductor, uh, they designed a, uh, they were started by a few people who worked for, I think at the time it was Lucent, and uh, they were working on a, a type of FET that uh, the project had gotten canceled, and they, just, they asked Lucent if they could buy the patent rights to that technology. They did, and they started a company, and they were doing some kind of RF FETs, and then they use that technology to do uh, standard MOSFETs for power electronics. And uh, they had some really good advantages to the technology. I'm, I'm not an, I'm not, not, wasn't a product engineer, so I don't know exactly what the difference is between your standard FETs and these kind of FETs, but they were just really uh, efficient. 
and uh, Texas Instruments liked what they had. Texas Instruments at the time didn't have any uh, FETs, so a lot of their evaluation boards would have their controller and their PWM generator, but uh, they'd have to use somebody else's FETs, and obviously that wasn't desirable, so they uh, decided to buy the company I was working for. That's interesting, because when you said you worked at a semiconductor company, I had this image in my head of you doing, like, microcontrollers or something like this. No, it was uh, it was all power electronics. You know, it was just, uh, just really fat. It's like they had, um, you know, N-channel, P-channel, and then they had in a, in one package an N and a P-fat, you know, stacked die on top of each other. Um, they had, I think they had other ones that had, uh, like, an integrated PWM, a chip inside with the two FETs, all about just, you know, real estate savings for, you know, designing this onto a motherboard. And that's the kind of market they had. They, uh, one of the customers, probably still one of their customers is Apple. I know at the time when I worked for them, uh, that was a big customer of theirs. And they actually got that customer before the TI, before TI acquired them. So they, uh, it's really good. It was a really good technology, but uh, again, pretty much anything that had to do with the power phases around, you know, a, a motherboard. That's that's the, the types of uh, semiconductors that they developed. And and so now being at Nikola and working on, as you said, uh, ten ounce copper boards, I, I could imagine that's a, a bit of a shift in mindset. Um, or do you find that um, there are similarities there with what you used to do at, uh, at Cyclone? Yeah, I mean, the only thing is, um, you know, when it well, I also worked for a design services house for Avnet. Uh, Avnet had acquired Premier Farnell, and Premier Farnell, prior to the Avnet acquisition, had acquired a, um, a design services house. So when I was at Avnet the last few years, I worked for the design services house. So I saw you know, a lot of other designs between the time I was doing stuff at TI and, and Nikola. But um, uh, but the, the main difference really is just uh, learning the creepaging, how to set up creepaging clearance uh, rules for the heavy copper. Clearance is pretty straightforward. Uh, creepage took a little, it was a little bit of a learning curve because I hadn't used that feature in Altium. But, you know, really what it comes down to is primarily you just have larger gaps the higher the higher cop, heavier copper weight you go up you you have to have uh, larger line widths and space and spaces so is that is that due to risk of uh ESD uh the primary concern is is uh you know creepage at high voltage you know the the uh, and also high current uh, some of the modules that uh the board said I that I did the, the PCB designed for um they control uh, IGBTs that are capable of 1,200 volts at 1,800 amps, mm, and it's mm -hmm. three per board. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, so this really high voltages on these things, uh, and so very large creepage, and uh, and clearance requirements, you know, on those high voltage sections to high high voltage to low voltage, and then some high voltage to its own reference ground. Of course, you don't want. Uh, you don't want dead shorts, or you don't want shorts due to voltage creeping across the board. Sure. I, when I when I hear ten ounce copper, I'm thinking this is super high current, and maybe it yeah. isn't super high voltage. Uh, well, it's, yeah, that's not always the case. But um, for what we do, you know, we're dealing with uh, motor drives and uh, various kinds of designs that would go on a a, a semi truck, right? An electric semi truck. Mm -hmm. So. We're dealing with high current and high voltage. Right, electrified semi trucks. So they've got a huge battery pack somewhere, and then you're routing all that power through these control boards. Yeah, essentially. Uh, I mean, yeah, not all the um, not all the current passes through. Like say the um, the w the one board that I was talking about that's controlling these FETs or IGBTs, uh, but there are some boards. Um, I'm doing a design right now that. Uh, I think it's 180 amps are going through the board. That's a lot of amps. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, the PCB. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, I, I mean, so uh, in in uh, backplanes that, that I've done, um, some backplanes can get to that level of current, um, but you're, never, you're not going to see, you know, 10-ounce copper they're going to interleave a bunch of copper in different layers because it's already going to be a higher layer count board. 
Right. And yeah, that's how they get the copper capacity. And so I think it uh, ends up working out to the equivalent of 10 ounces of copper if you were to take all that copper and stack it up on each other. It, it probably would. Uh, there's a there's a little disadvantage in that when you have one chuck in copper as opposed to like, you know, you know five, one 10 ounce layer as opposed to five two ounce layers that are stitched together, you know, it's, it's obviously uh, more thermally efficient or and electrically efficient that to just have one solid layer that is 10 ounce, right? I, I think so. Yeah, actually, I think that would make sense. And uh, depending on maybe depending on how you divide up the currents, right? Because maybe one of those layers gets the bulk of the current. And so the bulk of the, the heat is being generated there. Whereas in other layers, it's lower current so it's not so much heat and they can accept some of that heat from that other from that layer that's that's doing the bulk of the the heat generation yeah is that the right way to, is that the right way you would think about it yeah no that's it's fair to say i mean what, what it really comes down to like the the one that i'm doing right now it's um it's a board a system of a couple of boards right so we have the gate the gate drive board and then we have the power board and the gate drive board has you know it's only two ounce copper it's six layer and it, it has all the control circuitry and everything for that, you know, that mates, you know, and then it mates through connectors with the, uh, with the power board, whose main purpose is just to pass that, um, you know, the high voltage and current. So that, that's only a two layer board, the, the power board that I'm talking about for this application. But, um, but you could, ha you could have a, um, you know, six, eight layer stack up that has two ounce externally have all the control circuitry on that and have, you know, um, internal layers that are that are eight, ten ounce, or you know, I think the one fab house that we're using can do up to fifteen or twenty ounce. But the um, this there's another place uh, called Tayo Kogao Kogio, I think it's called. It's in um, it's in Japan, and they could do fifty seven ounce copper. That's like, I forget what it comes out to, but it's something like a quarter inch thick copper. <laughs> That's almost a joke. Like, okay, so I only say that because like, I, I get emails from, you know, manufacturers overseas all the time. And sometimes they're a little ridiculous. Like, you know, we'll do a 48 layer HDI PCB and I'm thinking, okay, no, you won't. Um, but <laughs> you know, when you hear like, oh, 57 ounce copper, like that can't be a thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, this this company um, they have some proprietary uh, um, processes that allow them to do things like embedded bus bars. You know, okay. so they could also do on one layer. They could have up to I think it's like ten ounce a ten ounce area, and a two ounce area on one layer. Mm, okay. So they have, but they're the only ones I heard of that can do that. And the advantage of that is instead of having the system like I talked about having a control board and then having the power board you could have the control circuitry in one area and then have the, the heavy copper uh, power in another area of that same same board it's kind of interesting though because you're like well how would I define that in Altium or any other tool for that matter that's and, exactly what I was just wondering yeah so the way that it would be done is you assign mechanical layers for okay this is a bus bar layer Right, and then you you just define that in your fab documentation, send it to them, and then they uh, they translate that. Because yeah, there's I don't think there's any software that can actually handle that just from you know any any kind of modern PCB design software. Well, sure. I mean, it, it's so conditioned to operate with just whatever the thickness is, the car the copper weight is on just mm -hmm. that one layer. Yeah. So, but when you say an embedded bus bar, I I think you mean um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but like a a large bus bar that maybe passes through a cutout into multiple layers, and it just ends up being a very thick no. piece of copper. Is that, uh, that's not correct? No, it's actually embedded in the stack up. Oh, okay. And the, okay. the leads come out, like say the middle of the, the stack up, and then hook up to I your see. battery or whatever it is that, you're, that you need the bus bars for. Okay, I see. That's interesting. Okay. Yeah, it's called, uh, again, Tayo, like Tayo Yudin, uh, Tayo, K-O-G-Y-O, Kogyo. Again, I don't know how you pronounce that exactly, but 
they're in Japan and uh, yeah if anybody needs their services I they do stuff that I I've never heard of anybody ever even talking about <laughs> yeah. I you know I've seen on some websites uh, where they talk about I think like 15 ounce or 30 ounce copper but 57 I think is the new record <laughs> yeah and I think I think they're um, you know when it comes to having the the heavy copper and the like two ounce copper on on one layer uh, i'm not 100 percent sure but i think there's some process limitation that limits those heavy copper areas to to 10 ounce but you know if you could embed a bus bar i guess <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you, you, you know this shouldn't be a problem to get the power through the board that you want it's uh, certainly <laughs> Yeah, and then I wonder what the process looks like for that because in my head I imagine you know a, a cutout that size to fit the bus bar, and they just toss it in there, and then they put the top layers over it or the outside layers over it, I should say. Yeah. But I'm sure I'm sure it's much more elaborate than that. So oh I'm yeah, just speculating here. Yeah, they're the only ones I ever heard of that has the capability. The only the only problem with using a company like that that has such a unique kind of process or unique process capability is that you know good luck shopping that around you know i mean if the mm -hmm. and i and i expressed some of the concerns i'm like well you know what happens if there's a typhoon and your facility gets wiped out you know then um i just can't get my my boards produced of course sorry for you guys but you know i mean i can't I, I don't like, I, I really hate using single source suppliers for anything. Components, you know, whenever, whenever they can be avoided, of course, I, I definitely uh, try to get multiple source for, you know, yep. footprint pin out and whatnot. But uh, for the PCB, you, you're just, yeah. I mean, you, you can't just shop that around anywhere because of the unique processes they have. The One of the things they said, though, is like if, if you order a board from them, you know, basically you put in a, an order for three years worth of boards or whatever it is, whatever you guys agree to, they produce all the boards at once. So they're not producing a hundred boards three years down the road. They got them all produced and they have some kind of way to preserve them, I guess. I'm not sure what they would use exactly, but I'm sure they'll gold plate it anyway. But, uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, no, they, they have some, some ways to mitigate the risk because they, they understand that. I, I suppose that makes sense. I mean, it's almost the same strategy that you have to use today when buying, when buying your your microcontroller or certain certain ASICs or whatever it may be. Um, try and project where you're going to be at in a year, maybe three years, and buy as much as you can now if you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's uh, it's kind of tough. I mean, um, I'm not an electrical engineer, but I do component engineering functions for the group that I'm in, mainly supply chain management, EOL, you know, obsolescence management and that kind of stuff. And then also finding alternates. Um, I was a component engineer at Avnet for six years, so I know a lot about com components. I'm just encouraging them to design in parts that they can find a pin to pin compatible and footprint compatible part. You know, of course, for logic ICs and things like that, it's easier to do. Uh, a lot of them have common pinouts, but again, when you get into PMIX and certain other types of parts, it's, it just is what it is, you know. Yeah, and then with some analog parts, or like I had to deal with this recently with an ADC, um, it's always nice if you can get pin compatible from the same vendor, but then uh, specifications yeah. vary, and if you need really tight specifications, you may be out of luck. Yeah, it's this is just crazy, the situation we're all in. Uh, I've never anywhere near this kind of this kind of uh, you know stuck like we are in so many designs just having to buy parts to support production for two three years just because they're they're just not around <laughs> you have to, yeah that that was actually something i was going to ask you was maybe what is your perspective on shortages uh over the long term and, and i i bring it up because um I started working, you know, in the industry level in 2017. Um, before that, I was in academia doing, you know, research and teaching. Um, so I, I was never having to go to, to DigiKey and buy, you know, 400 parts for an assembly or whatever it may be. Yeah. So th this is 
my, my perspective on this is not as, as broad as I think uh, some other folks. Um, you know, my first experience with the word shortage in the context of electronics was with uh, capacitors, you know, 2018-ish. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then it seemed to roll over to semiconductors in 2020, 2021. And I'm wondering if, if the, the if, you know, based on just your experience, you've seen this kind of shortage issue just rolled around to different component classes. Uh, well, I think that the capacitor issue you're probably referring to, I think you're talking about tantalum caps. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So there was an issue, some deal with, um, you know, there's, I think it was like, there was a conflict minerals issue with tantalum in Africa and whatnot. And so some of that, you know, I think some of that was related to the shortage on that, but we haven't seen something as widespread as we are seeing now. It's, it's ICs. It's even a lot of times capacitors as well. You know, your standard, you know, whatever, like 50 volt, you know, hundred microfarad electrolytic cap surface mount, you know, sometimes you just can't get them. Uh, it, there's a shortage that's across all different types of components, even connectors. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's it's interesting because it's like not only is the the desired part out of top, but uh, out of stock, but the the substitute is out of stock, and the substitute substitute yeah, is out of exactly. stock. Yeah, yeah, we had to design in I think like three different Lin transceivers because we designed in the one, and then it wasn't available. Then the other one that the alternate we selected was plentiful, and then it was gone. And then uh, third one. Fortunately, we found foot to footprint and pin to pin compatibility there. But again, that's uh, not the case typically with um, with complex ICs. I guess these aren't complex. I guess they're pretty simple. But uh, but yeah, no, it's um, it's it's just crazy these days. Well, and I've had to have standing alerts with uh, on on certain parts with mm -hmm. with distributors in order to get some notification when they're having something come in stock yeah. and it's immediately over to the client. Hey, this is coming in. You know, how many do you want? How many should we get? And of yep. course they're like all of them. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We're having, um, we're designing in some, an FPGA in a certain application and, um, you know, they're talking 52 week lead time for the FPGA. And in that instance, it's either alternative vendor, which impacts your uh, development, because now you've basically got to translate all of that development over to uh, to that other vendor's development tool, um, or you've got to just what buy a larger FPGA and use less less silicon. Yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to buy uh, some dev dev kits, um, or we have some dev kits already for the FPGA we're going to design in. So what we're probably going to do is use that, use that reference. That's my kitty. <laughs> we're going to use my use the 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 dev kit to hook everything up. Maybe make a custom board that interfaces from the um, dev kit to uh, to our application or to the other boards in our system. And then um, you know prove out everything, control circuitry, code, and everything. And once we get that all good to go. Uh, by the time we're ready to go to production um, or have everything else proven out, you know, the hardware is the last variable, right? We, we'd have to do our own carrier design and, um, you know, maybe a SOM and a carrier or just uh, our own custom chip down FPGA design on, you know, with all the peripherals on it, whatever. Um, but, uh, yeah, it looks, it looks like we're kind of, we're going to, we're going to have to do that for this application because we just can't get the parts even getting getting samples you know to support just our prototype development they're talking like 20 weeks it's ridiculous yeah wow when you said you're buying dev boards or buying uh sound like evaluation products um i'm going to be honest i was a little concerned that you were about to say well we're going to buy those and uh, desolder and that's how we're going to get chips you know what? I, actually, that was, that was something that I was thinking about just to prove out the, you know, like, um, so uh, I was thinking about maybe, you know, in desperation mode, maybe buying five eval boards just so we could just do some prototype validation. But uh, it looks like what we're probably going to do is um, we're going to, Avnet has a lot of good, really good uh, FPGA reference designs 
they also have their own series of products called Micro Z, Pico Z, and uh, Ultra Z. Um, and uh, they, uh, they're just outstanding. When I worked at Avnet, I was in the board design group that, that designed those. And uh, I, you know, even those have long lead times, though, but we could probably get a few evaluation kits, carrier and some, and um, just at least uh, use that to, again, prove out or get our code and control circuitry all working with the system. And then down the road, either, um, you know, buy SOMs in volume when they're there and use them in production. One of the things that Avnet will do with, um, you know, licensing agreements and whatnot and a, a large NRE fee, they will sell you the design source files for their SOMs because it's an Avnet branded product. It's not just a dev kit These are, or a dev board. These are their products. Uh, but you, you can purchase that, and, uh, you know, once you get the design files, you can um, do the chip-down version, just integrate the board, the, the, the SOM with the carrier instead of having a plug-in carrier. But the first phase would just be taking their SOM as it is, designing our own carrier, or taking their carrier source files, which they will give away, um, and just uh, designing that system. Interesting. Okay. I'd like to, to switch gears now for a moment because I'd mentioned in the uh, intro that um, you have a company called ECAD Central. And um, for those that are listening and don't know, um, ECAD Central is actually an Altium partner in Arizona. Um, maybe you could tell us all uh, what ECAD Central does. Yeah. So the bas basically what the services I provide are, uh, um, you know, Altium server setup and configuration. That's, you know, whether it's uh, you know, Nexus or Concord Pro or A365. Um, you know, we have about eight years experience setting up these servers. I've personally set up dozens of these servers from scratch, uh, several when I was at Avnet. I also did uh, database migration going from Concord Pro to A365. I migrated all of our component data, all of our design source files. At the time, uh, I don't know if there's anything now that uh, makes that a shorter, quicker path, but uh, at the time it was pretty much manual and it was like moving a mountain and to have everything correct in the end, uh, you know, it's, it's quite a feat. There's so many pitfalls that you could, um, you could uh, fall in, well, that you could run into, but, um, you know, because I had a lot of experience prior to that with the, with the software and creating database libraries, um, you know, was able to do that successfully. I've done that for other customers as well. Uh, 9.connects is uh, phenomenal when it comes to this kind of service as well. I've actually done a lot of contract work for them. Um, they're a bigger organization than ECAD Central, but um, I'm cheaper. <laughs> so, well that's fair yeah, sure. um <laughs> but uh but so, yeah that's a, basically what it is is just set up uh, the server setup and configuration database migration i also can do database administration if they don't have the bandwidth um custom component databases i could create them and migrate them to their server or i can uh, create them for them and give them instructions how to migrate them uh, as database libraries um i also do um bomb maintenance service so if you have a you know especially these days where component shortages are just all too common uh, I could maintain your bomb and just basically ensure that uh, you're aware when parts start going uh, you know will become unavailable in distribution just basically be like a monthly service and they just uh, you know scrub your scrub your bomb once a month and then let you know of any problem parts that may be coming up based on your predicted uh, projected volumes that you need of those parts. Uh, library cleanup and migration, you know, a lot of places have uh, site libraries and then they go to, they want to go to a data, Altium database product like, you know, all A365. And, um, you know, sometimes you have libraries that are, you know, engineer A, engineer B, and engineer C, and then you want to use all those parts, but the slight variations and, text, font, pin length, all these things, whatever, but I could take all those parts, clean them up, unify them in appearance and, uh, you know, all aspects that uh, can be unified, and then uh, give that back to you, or again, I could migrate that for you uh, into 
into A365 or Concord Pro, whatever your database product is. Um, and also I have about 40,000 parts that I created myself that are in my A365 server that I can migrate as is for a certain price. It just depends. I realize uh, getting libraries from other people is always, is always, uh, there's always a, there's always unknowns. You don't know what you're going to get, but uh, I've been doing, I've been making my own parts for 14 years. Uh, it's very rare that I'll have an issue. Uh, most of these parts, at least all the passive, sub, passive footprints have been uh, production proven. Uh, as far as, uh, and also design source file conversion, I could do that, um, you know, for you. I've done that many times for, for all different uh, tool to tool conversions, well, well, from other tools to Altium Designer. Uh, the only limitation I have when it comes to Altium database products is that I don't have a, a, a great amount of experience with, well, I don't, I don't have much experience at all with the Nexus Enterprise workflows or the PLM integration part of that. But other than that, uh, I know these systems inside and out. I've been setting up these servers, using them for about eight years now. But uh, that's that's pretty much that. So you brought up something interesting because this is a question that I've been asked before, um, which is uh, conversions and migration from another CAD platform, or maybe not full migration, but at least uh, mirroring what's going on in your Altium server with respect to maybe what they have stored in another server uh, as far as uh, parts. Um, is that something that you've had to deal with? Uh, like maybe, let's say, a company wants to uh, they want they they want to add Altium to their to their capabilities, but they've been mm -hmm. working in pads for the last you know ten years or whatever, um, and so they have all these parts in pads. Have you uh, had experience making sure that those two systems play well together through either an Altium product or through maybe a third party uh, system? I've I haven't really done a lot of um, library conversion from tool to tool, but uh, I can do it. Um, I know how to ensure that the library is good. There's a lot of um, global edits. Uh, Altium has some really good global editing interfaces, such as the PCB Liblist editor, uh, where you could globally change what's on mechanical layer one to mechanical layer thirteen or whatever. You know, so. Um, if I get a library and port it into Altium, I could do global edits to clean things up and just make things uh, comply with whatever Altium layer configuration they want. So I have the ability to do it. I just haven't done a lot of, um, this is my pads library, please migrate it. Mm. Well, because something that, that comes up that, that I've, I've been asked is, Someone will, or a company will say, you know, we want to we want to migrate to Altium, but we still have this giant stack of designs from yeah. the last, you know, ten or twenty years, and we we're going to have to maintain one license in this old tool just so that we can access these and, and set them up for conversion when we need to, because you know right. if they've got ten thousand old designs, I mean, are yeah. they really going to spend a year, you know, <laughs> translating every single design in, into the new tool, or are they just going to you know triage it as they need to? But right. they want to make sure that the parts are all in alignment, and so then they look at okay, how can we make sure that the parts are mirrored between the two systems? Yeah, I mean, what I would do is I would uh, get a copy of their design source or the ask them for an output that can uh, import into Altium. I'd import their design into Altium, make PC, make PCB and schematic uh, libraries out of them, uh, take those, clean them up, uh, again, based on their preferences for their Altium layer usage uh, for mechanical layers in particular. And uh, once I globally edited all those, then I would release them if they had A365 or something. Then I'd then I'd set them up to release them into their into their new server. Um, There's a little bit more work though. It would be the the preferred method is to create a database library. Uh, so using the um, I think it's the parameter manager in the schematic lib, you could go in there and get a um, basically um, you know columns and rows. You have to do cleanup and whatnot, and it's best to do it component by component, so all resistors and all capacitors and 
whatnot, the parts with similar parameters. Uh, so sometimes you have to take that larger library and split it up into uh, the, the specific component types. And then you go into that uh, parameter manager interface, copy and paste into Excel, build your date back into your database, assign the symbols and footprints once you clean them up, and uh, basically there you go. Uh, that's, that's in a nutshell. Okay. Well, it isn't. Def it's definitely not a simple uh, drag and drop operation. Oh no! So, so. <laughs> <laughs> not by a long. I think it's the main takeaway here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe in the future it will be, but I guess uh, until uh, everyone gets used to standardizing their libraries with all those different parameters, it'll never happen. Yeah, that's true. Okay, well, if anybody out there that is listening it needs these services, and I know that they are needed because, as I said, they do come up from time to time, I would welcome them to contact ECAD Central or contact you directly. Um, we'll include some links uh, to ECAD Central um, and uh, to your LinkedIn uh, in the uh, show notes. So anybody that's interested, check out the show notes for those links. Um, Mario, this has been a very fun talk, and uh, of course you have educated me on some of the uh, capabilities uh, regarding uh, high or heavy uh, copper boards. Um, this is I, I never thought I'd hear someone say 57 ounce copper, um, <laughs> but there you go. <laughs> yep. They're out there. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, thank you so much for joining us, and um, I think we'll leave it at that and, and uh, make sure uh, everybody make sure to check out the show notes and um, make sure to uh, contact ECAD Central if you are in need of any of these uh, critical migration or server setup services. Um, with that, uh, make sure to hit the subscribe button on YouTube. You can uh, stay caught up with all of our upcoming episodes. And last but not least, don't stop learning, stay on track, and we'll see you next time.